President Biden's declaration that Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power is now fueling concerns that intentional or not, that comment could be seen as an escalation or potentially complicate the diplomatic efforts to end this war. Let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein for more on this. Rick, first off, what do we know about that moment? Was Biden just speaking off the cuff? It was not part of the prepared remarks, we're told, Diane, and it seemed to be something where he maybe got carried away in the moment. Uh, the end result, though, is a moment that might have uh, might have carried some moral clarity as a capstone to a, a very carefully crafted speech, instead left a geopolitical mess because it, it meant that the, the next couple of days have been spent by White House aides and, and friends of the White House trying to explain that what the president said actually does not represent U.S. policy, that it does not represent, as Biden himself said, it wouldn't just yesterday, uh, regime change policy. That has significant meaning in the, in the world of foreign policy and international relations. It would have put the United States in a much more aggressive posture with regard to, to Vladimir Putin. And again, uh, it seemed like Biden was just kind of caught in the moment in adding those words that have spent um, now, now, now meant that his, his aides and associates have to spend days cleaning it up. Now, President Biden also called Vladimir Putin a war criminal. And at the time, it was before the State Department officially had that finding. Jen Psaki explained it as he was speaking from the heart. But if he already called him a war criminal, why then is this comment being viewed as so much more potentially escalatory? It is. There is a difference there. And it may seem that you're worse to be called a war criminal than to have someone call for your ouster. But it does have meaning because it, if you're favoring regime change, it means that the U.S. policy is to change the leadership of the Russian government. And of course, the way that the U.S. approaches every other country is that everyone has a right to choose their own leaders. Uh, and it, what it did, though, is give Vladimir Putin a much needed and a rare propaganda victory. He can now claim that the American president is asking for his ouster. The Russians have reacted angrily, said, look, the decision of uh, who leads Russia is up to Russians, and there is no role for the United States president, the U.S. president and Biden, uh, to have anything to say about it. So it does have, a, I think, a significant um, distinction, and that's why you've had this result where uh, we've got the, the, the U.S. side spending 24, 48 hours trying to say what the U.S. policy is not, even though this whole trip was about isolating Vladimir Putin, putting more pressure on Putin, maybe even trying to, 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 to get more elements inside of Russia to recognize the reality of the situation. Instead, we now have to emphasize that what we don't want to do is, is force Putin out by any, by any force that, that, that the U.S. might be able to apply. Yeah, so the whole point of this trip was to reaffirm the United States' support for the NATO alliance and to show how united that alliance is. What inroads do you think President Biden made uh, in Europe? And do you think this comment negates that process, all of it, some of it? What do you think? I don't think negates it. I think it, it, it certainly detracts from it. It takes away from it. It creates some problems down the road, potentially for the U.S. Uh, but the, the end result of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and having allies inside of NATO, having relative unity inside of NATO is there. Uh, even though we've seen uh, some diminishing support in public opinion polls back home, even though there's some, some rest of allies inside of NATO, the, the, the support remains strong. And I think the message that Biden delivered by being there in person, by being kind of of the, the face of NATO for a few days, all of that was delivered. Uh, I think we'll have to see, because this is a war being fought on so many different fronts, including economic fronts, including information fronts, how this ultimately plays. I do think it makes things more complicated for the United States, and it's a distraction for the White House. But uh, what's going on on the ground, in the air, in, inside Ukraine, uh, isn't changed by this comment. So, Rick, what are the next steps for the U.S. in terms of trying to show support for Ukraine, but also not escalate things with Russia? Yeah, we heard last week the administration, uh, a billion dollars in new aid uh, being offered, humanitarian assistance, including for some vulnerable groups, uh, an announcement that the U.S. would, would, would accept some 100,000 refugees into the country. But, of, of course, we've seen Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, uh, increase his calls for additional military aid. That isn't something that the U.S. is willing to do so far. We know the situation with those Polish, uh, those Polish jets. We also know that the, the no-fly zone is still off the table. So as we seek a a, 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 some kind of a negotiated peace or some kind of a settlement in Ukraine, it becomes more difficult for the U.S. to, to be a partner in this. And, and I think it's going to affect policy moving forward. All right, Rick Klein. Thank you, Rick. 
Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.